Okay, so uh, I have a confession to make, which is this, that I was very, very proud of myself. I got to Thursday and I realized I was well ahead of myself. I'd written my sermon, everything was wonderful. And I came to our Bible study in the afternoon and, and uh, Chris Jacks said, oh, it's Palm Sunday, I'm looking forward to, to getting the, the Palm Crosses out. And I suddenly went, oh yeah, I need to write another sermon now, don't I? So I went home and wrote a different one. Anyway, so uh, we're looking today, uh, departed slightly from where I was going, um, to, uh, to take a look at the triumphant entry of Jesus. So we've got a couple of Bible uh, readings. Uh, I'm going to be looking at two different ones. I'm going to be looking at uh, one from uh, John chapter 12 and one from Romans 8. So uh, I've got a couple of different people reading. So Tori, um, let, let's try again. Um, Lauren, you're going to read uh, my first one, uh, which is uh, from John chapter 12. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about his miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. Thank you very much. Uh, Toria is going to come and read to us from Romans chapter 8. And uh, this is uh, some of my favorite scripture. Uh, and I'm purposely pulling it apart over a few weeks. So uh, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Jesus Christ died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honour at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Amazing. So last week I suggested that I could just read a chunk of Romans 8 and then put the microphone down and go home. I think we could have done that one off the back of that one. Uh, so today we're looking at... Um, uh, I've, Nick, I've got your Bible here. I've got, I'm so holy, I've got two Bibles. <laughs> right now I'm back to normal holy standards with my one Bible. Right, so I'm looking today at uh, the, the idea that, that as Jesus walks into Jerusalem, well, he doesn't walk in, does he? How does he arrive? In a Mercedes, somebody said, was that right? Yeah. What was that? In, on a what? On a, on, a, on a donkey, on a colt, on a, on a young donkey. And, uh, and so we've got this moment as, as Jesus kind of rides in. Now, bearing in mind that uh, it, that's kind of almost the equivalent of, um, of Jesus driving in in a Deu or a Skoda. It's, it's not him coming in on a white stallion, which is, as imagine, most people would have imagined that the king would be riding in on something that was going to wow everybody with a big triumphant, like you'd know he was coming 20 minutes before because you could hear the trumpets. And then you could imagine all the banners as they would come in. And then Jesus, dressed in gold and silver armor, coming in to the city on a white stallion. That's what you would expect. And what does Jesus do? He turns it on his head. He comes in on a young donkey, which is like, again, low standards, right? I love this. And as Jesus comes in, still something begins to stir within the people. Now, as we read through John's gospel, we see a whole series of different things. On the run up to this, we've seen Lazarus, 
who's been raised from the dead. We have a little bit of a mention of this. Some people were there that saw it. And they're there in Jerusalem as Jesus is coming in and they're starting to tell the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. On the run up to this, we've seen Jesus perform some huge, huge miracles from the feeding of the 5,000 with uh, not, not much food. Uh, for, for, for then there's this huge moment where, where Jesus then kind of goes slightly off on one and he starts talking about, hey, if you're hungry, eat my flesh. Uh, and he starts talking about how he's the bread of life. And he's, what he's talking about is something on a much bigger standard, but the people just didn't get it. And then the people were fickle. One minute they're loving him. Next minute they're running away from him. There's this moment where, where uh, Jesus turns around to his disciples and he says, as all of these people were leaving, and not actually in, in, the, in the scripture, actually says, and, his, and the disciples began to leave. And that wasn't the 12, because he turns then to the 12 and says, will you leave also? So we have this moment where they're, like, they're loving him, they're coming out in their thousands, and we've said the feeding of the 5,000 is the feeding of 5,000 men, uh, and they didn't leave their women at home because we know there were women there, and we also know there's children there because who was it that has the, the bread and the fish? It's a little boy. So your feeding of the 5,000, even if it was one woman per man, works out as the feeding of 10,000. And then if there's kids there as well, bump that up by at least, you know, because in, in, in England where we, we're the sort of two, two kids per household kind of thing. So if we were to say that it was that and it wasn't the standing as it probably was with 12 kids per household, if we were just to say two kids per household, the feeding of the 5,000 becomes the feeding of the 20,000. It's ridiculous. But if you think that's a huge crowd... So then as Jesus walks in, we get this moment where it just erupts with praise. In different scriptures, it tells us different things. We talk about how Jesus uh, turns around and says, hey, if, if, the, if the people don't praise, then the stones themselves will rise and will begin to praise. So we've got this moment as Jesus walks in that the crowd of people are going crazy. But only weeks before... They're deciding that they don't want anything to do with them. And then they're now back to being full of praise. Now, we've done Easter quite a few times. We know what's coming. We also, we know the end of the story, so we know the good news that is yet to come. But if you fast forward a few more, just in the middle of Jesus' trial, it says that the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, went out to the crowd and got them all geared up and ready to shout for the crucifixion of Jesus. It's the same crowd that is here saying how amazing it is that Jesus has arrived. Okay, so just take a moment. I want you to pretend that you've got the ability to kind of go back in time to that moment. Imagine being in Jerusalem. Imagine being there as Jesus comes in on this donkey. And uh, imagine what that would be like, right? Im imagine how that would feel, like that, that sense of excitement. And as the crowd is getting excitement, wouldn't you feel it in your stomach? I don't know if you've ever been to a concert and, uh, and suddenly as the band comes out, everyone gets excited. I remember being invited to go to a, a concert uh, with a friend and I had, ne had no idea. I went to go see Pulp uh, um, and they were playing a, a gig in Bridlington and my friend had bought tickets uh, for him and his friend, and his friend got ill and he couldn't go. So I went, uh, and I didn't even know who they were, right? And I, I remember like being there, and suddenly the band came out, Jarvis Cocker bounces onto the stage, full of energy, and the crowd went nuts. And I'm standing there, suddenly overwhelmed by the emotion of the crowd, and I'm like, woo! I don't even know who they are. But I'm like, yeah! <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed that. I bought several albums after that concert. But, but there's a moment, like, just like, for me, it, there's, we, we know what it's like to be around people that get excited, you know? There's, uh, there's, there's, there is something about, you know, the excitement of an individual. We know what it's like when our friend, for example, has maybe just bought a new device and they're really excited about it. You know, maybe it's the new, I don't know, Apple device, whatever it is. And as they start to talk about it with a level of excitement, by the end of that conversation, you're like, I need that device in my life. 
I mean, I didn't before. I'm pretty certain I still don't. But now after being around that person, I do. Imagine that times, you know, a good thousand people as they're all starting to get excited. No wonder there's just this sense of overwhelming excitement. Feelings do wonderful things. And they also do some really interesting things as well. So I want to just kind of take a moment and just look at, uh, at this, this moment where um, where the crowd goes crazy and the screaming and shouting praise. But then shortly afterwards, that same crowd is shouting for Jesus. But instead of shouting for Jesus to be their king, they're shouting for Jesus to be crucified. And what I want to do is I want to take a moment and just look at how fickle the crowd is. But also to understand what it must be like if I was there, would I have been in the crowd that was shouting praise for Jesus as he walked in? Well, at this point, I'm happily say absolutely, categorically, yes. But as the crowd then suddenly is geared up to shout against, am I bold enough to say that I would be the one standing in the crowd going, no? Or would I get swept up in the emotion of the crowd and find myself shouting, Yes. Deep question. One of the greatest lies that our generation is told, one of the greatest lies our generation is told, is this. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. It sounds beautiful. You know, it's very romantic. Follow your heart. Because actually, you know, what are you passionate about? Follow the things that you're passionate about. What are your emotions telling you? Follow your emotions. You know, I don't know what to do for a living. What, what, you know, what, follow your heart. Do, do what you want to do. You know, on principle, that sounds great, you know. But actually, the heart is ridiculously fickle. Follow your heart. I'll let you in on a secret. In my kitchen, when there's nobody else in the house, I like to crank up the music and dance. Dance like crazy dance, Right? Dan said, if my neighbours were to look in through the window, I think I'd be a little bit embarrassed. But I'm dancing. Love it. To the point that I'm sweaty and I'm just tired, but I'm happy. Right? Now, if you'd say to me, hey, Phil, what brings you joy? I'd be like, dancing. Follow your heart, Phil. Does that mean I should give up being a minister of a church and follow professional dance? Because that sounds great for a moment. Until I actually, you know, stand before my first audition, <laughs> it feels stupid, right? <laughs> Would I, is, that a, is that wise? Is that wise for me to do that? You know, give up, give up this to follow something that I'm passionate about? No, that's danger. We say follow our hearts. That's great. When you meet somebody and you fall in love, you are following your heart, but there's a whole load of brain that also has to get involved. Because is there any wonder the amount of times that we get into a, uh, for, for those of you who are, we're still like, can remember back to being single, is there any wonder that, 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 you, that you found yourself being swayed from one minute to the next, that you were really into this person and it was wonderful, but then the emotions begin to wear off and the reality begins to set in and your head and your heart are in two very different places and then you start to realize, oh gosh, I probably shouldn't have got so interested in that individual. On the flip side of that, when you get married and you're in a long-term relationship and you're with that person and you've made all of these statements, follow your heart becomes a really dangerous statement. What happens if somebody gives you that look? What happens if somebody just happens to meet you on a, and you connect on a level where actually, you know, the sense of humor or intellect or all of these other things and suddenly you find yourself questioning? Well, that's human nature. The question is what you do with it. And if I say follow my heart, then that's just a recipe for broken relationship after broken relationship after broken relationship. Our feelings are utterly fickle. Follow your heart is one of the most dangerous lies. For millennials, that this has become so much a part of our DNA means that as soon as we get excited about something, then we throw ourselves into it whether that's humanitarian efforts, 
whether that's being on the coffee road or in church. Whatever it might be, we throw ourselves into it until the next exciting thing comes along that grabs our imagination. We say, wow, something needs to be done. So we give ourselves wholeheartedly to the new thing. But what happens to the thing we were just doing? Well, because we don't feel those feelings that we felt before, we ditch it and move on to the new. Follow your heart is dangerous. Follow your heart is, as I say, probably one of the greatest lies that we're fed. See, if you do this, then you're guaranteed heartbreak as you lose partners, jobs, maybe church, possibly faith. Maybe the town or the city as you move from one place to another. Maybe your home. Maybe all, there's all of these different things that, that actually through the concept of following our emotions and our feelings can lead us to all sorts of dangerous, dangerous places. So coming back to that crowd outside Jerusalem. If I was there, would I have been excitedly shouting out and if I couldn't grab hold of a palm leaf, it says that they laid their coats down so that the, the cult would rest its feet upon it. This is the, the greatest red carpet experience ever. Would I have been there? But then swept along with my heart, would I then have been there at the same time when Jesus was being tried? And the religious leaders came out and got everybody really excited about crucifying Jesus. Would my voice have been found among the crowd? That's quite a scary thought, isn't it? I say this because I want us to grab hold of something. And that is that our feelings, more often than not, can't be trusted. Our feelings, more often than not, cannot be trusted. In Romans chapter 8, last week we uh, finished off by, uh, by this wonderful statement. As it says this, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs in God's glory. We are heirs in God's glory. Now, I want us to grab that because the sentence that comes after this spins it on its head. But initially, let's just take a moment and to look at that, that we are heirs in God's glory, which means that God has said to you and to me that he wants you to become part of his family, that he wants to redeem you from your past and wants to set you free from the things to which you were bound to, and he wants to welcome you into a new life with him that brings glory to him and that brings you into a place of new life. This is what God wants to do. This is what this verse is all about, that we get to call God Father. And the word Abba is like Papa or Dad or even more intimately, Daddy. It's, it's a word that doesn't really translate, which is the reason why we keep getting it as Abba in our Bible. Because if I was to call him Daddy God, I think a few of us would be a little bit like, ooh, not sure I feel about that. So Abba. But it's a great term because it shows the intimate relationship we have with the Father. However, the next verse is this. Well, the next line of this verse is, but if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering we must also share his suffering and some of us are a little bit like "Ooh, I'm not so sure about that one fella I want an easy life fella I, I, I want when I become a Christian I want it to be something that's amazing and that I just ride this high for the rest of my life do you know what I want that too but Jesus doesn't promise that if I'm honest, that's a side of Christianity that has been ignored hugely over the last at least 50 years, possibly even a bit more. 
as we start to talk about how great it is to be a Christian, we also seem to miss out on the, and share in his suffering. What is it when, when Jesus is talking about, um, uh, when he's inviting people to come and, uh, and actually follow him? Well, if you were to go to John uh, again, and you were to look at verse 15, it talks about how if you follow him, uh, in verses 18 through, he talks about if you're going to follow Jesus, expect the world to hate you. He goes on and says, if the world ha- hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as its own if you belonged to it, but you are no longer part of this world. I chose you to come out of this world, and so it hates you. And it just goes on. This is, this is not a selling point. <laughs> you know, become a Christian and, hey guys, the world's going to hate you. But actually, in doing so, what, what Jesus is actually clearly stating is that, that actually if we choose to follow him, that life will get difficult. You know, in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 25, it talks about if you want to follow Jesus, he says, pick up your cross and follow me. Pick up your cross. Now to us, when I think of a cross, I look at some of you and you've got beautiful little silver crosses around your necks. Fabulous, love it. Many of you here have got little, little wooden crosses that you're holding in your hands. And to us, it means victory. To us, it means Jesus died for me. To us, it means because of this, I'm welcomed into the family. But to the people of the day, when he said, pick up your cross, well, that's an instrument of death. Like every day outside the main cities would be multiple people who had been crucified in the most brutal of fashions in order to be able to state, this is the Roman saying this, if you don't do as we say, this is what will happen to you. It's fear mongering at its greatest. Jesus uses this analogy before he's even crucified. He says, pick up your cross. He doesn't say pick up my cross. He says, pick up your cross. Pick up your cross and follow me. Which means that actually the life that you're living leads to, essentially, to death. It's the instrument to which you yourself will be crucified on. That's what he's saying. Now there's a level of ouch in this. And I want you to feel that. Because what he's wanting you to realize is that, that actually there is death in following Christ. There's death to our old self. There's death to the, the life that I used to live. And for us today, I'd argue that some of that means for me to actively choose to put to death parts of myself on a day-to-day life. It means for me to actively choose to put to death parts of myself on a day-to-day life. Why? Because there's parts in my own life I know that are not right and I need to do something about that. Either I can choose to stay in that or I can choose to say I don't want to be part of that. Coming back to Romans 8, that wonderful section of scripture that Tori just read to us. Well, it says this, what shall we say about these wonderful things? Now, I'm a bearing mind, I've just been talking about crucifying yourself, that doesn't sound wonderful. Paul, previously to this, is just talking about the future glory, the hope of, of, of going to be with God when we die. But then he says this, if God is for us, then who can be against us? If God is for us, then who can be against us? And then he goes on and says then in verse 34, who then will condemn us? No one. This goes back to last week and I was explaining to you that there's times when our feelings are involved and in those moments that the enemy whispers and says, are you sure? Do you remember we talked about that? It's like, you know, we think about the promises of what God has done for us. And in those moments, the enemy's just there ready to whisper and say, are you sure? Are you sure he loves you? Are you sure he's for you? Are you sure he actually exists? Are you sure that you're a Christian? Are you sure? Are you sure? Because that moment of doubt is what sends us spiraling out of control. So when I'm talking here about putting to death parts of yourself, it almost makes me go, in in those moments, no, I will not live that. I'm going to choose to do something contrary. And I'm choosing to put that part of me to death. I think 
in the West, we've come to some really crazy theology about God. Some crazy theology. And I just want to question you on this. This is where we're kind of coming in to land on this. Many of us have grabbed hold of this idea that if I'm a child of God, then that means that God's going to be tangibly with me all the time. For those of you who have experienced that, the warmth of the presence of God, maybe in worship, maybe in a retreat, maybe as you're praying in your bedroom, maybe you're driving along in your car listening to music, whatever it is, and kind of have that sense of like, wow, God's real. Well, those feelings are wonderful because it's just as God arrives, our spirit within us begins to move and we're like, this is amazing. But you ask any long-term Christian, does that emotion last? No. So if my feelings validate the presence of God, if my feelings validate the presence of God, what happens when I don't feel God? Does that then mean that because of the absence of my feelings, that validates the absence of God? This is something that is real and I want us to grab hold of because I think somehow we've got into this mindset that if I don't feel God, he's not there. Our feelings somehow manage to dictate to us. What about when we find ourselves in trials where life's gone wrong? Well, actually, the amount of people who I love and who I've spent time with, who have walked away from church, have often walked away from church because life's gone hard. It's got difficult. And because they've associated that when my life is going well, God is blessing me, which I believe that he is, that then when life goes difficult, somehow that that theology, is as beautiful as that is, gets twisted to if I'm not being blessed. The opposite of a blessing is a curse, then am I under the curse of God? Because now my life's got hard. I've got sickness in my body. My, my finances have dropped. My, my, my life's got hard. My, my kids are ill. You know, the, you name it. These are all the things. And so in, from one moment when life was great, the sun was shining, God's blessing me. Then what happens when I'm no longer in that? Then the question is, well, the opposite of that is if God was there and I don't feel him now, Am I under a curse or is, is, does God no longer love me? Now, as much as we know when we begin to look at scripture that that's completely untrue, completely untrue. Our feelings are what dictates our reality. And so in those moments, you can understand how people go, God has forsaken me. He's not walking with me through this. And I get this, as I walk with people and I hear them on the brinks of tears and they're kind of saying, Phil, listen, life has gone so hard and everything's against me. Where is God? If there's a loving God, and I believe that there was, but I'm beginning to question it now, where is he? Why am I going through this? And our theology is dictated by our emotions so that suddenly the absence of feelings and the absence of, of that kind of feel of blessing suddenly makes it feel as though God has, is punishing me or God is cursing me or God has just left me. And I say this because if we, if we allow these tiny lies to work their way in, if we allow these tiny lies to work their way in, then it dictates how we walk our faith. When we're going through difficult times, am I going to be able to still praise God when life's hard, when, when there's sickness and when there's pain? Because do you know what? A fact, every one of you here is going to die, right? A brutal, nasty fact, right? But it's the inevitability our bodies are not built to last. Our minds are not built to last. Which means that there's going to be an inevitable time where we get to that chapter and that chapter is going to end. Now, does that mean that, well, Jesus came to bring life and life to the full and I'm dying, so this means that Jesus is no longer with me? And I look at it through that lens, that seems ludicrous. Yet why is it that I transfer that to the other areas of my life? The fact is, we're human. 
our bodies are going to fail, sometimes from time to time, sometimes in massive, colossal, brutal ways. Does that mean that God doesn't love me? No. What Jesus promises is that he will walk with you through all things. Verse 35. I'm just going to finish by reading this. This is what Tori just finished reading to us. Just let this sink into your heart, guys. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we go through trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We have been slaughtered like sheep. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Overwhelming victory is yours through Christ who loves you. Through Christ who loves you. We need to take this. We need to grab this. This is what we need to allow to permeate our lives so that when we go through calamity, when we go through danger, when we go through persecution, when we're hungry and can't afford to feed ourselves, when we are threatened, when we are ill, when we are sick, that God still loves you and promises to walk with you through it. This is the truth that needs to become our doctrine. That when our feelings tell us otherwise, we say, no, this is the reality, not my feelings. My feelings will not dictate whether God is real or not in this moment. God is real, regardless of what my feelings say. This is the truth that we need to grab hold of. Let's take a moment to, to pray and, and then we're going to finish by singing the song Dwell and in this it talks about the difficulties of life but how we choose to shelter in the shadow of God's wings. It's a term from Isaiah but it's just this idea of like just choosing to dwell in his presence even when life goes wrong let's take a moment just to pray in the silence i just want you just to invite god just to fill you afresh in this moment and then i'll open in prayer